So hello, my name is Guillaume Tegadat. I'm the, the main author on this work. And I'm going to be talking about uh, using an optimal cloner to perform joint measurements of non-commuting and in particular complementary observables. So this work was done in the lab of Professor Jeff Lundin at the University of Ottawa. And here in the bottom right are our, our funding agencies. So the starting point for this work is non-commuting observables. And uh, two observables A and B are said to be non-commuting if their commuter, if their commutator is, is non-zero, that's an obvious statement. But we can look at the physical consequences of two observables non-commuting. So one consequence is that because they don't have simultaneous eigenstates, that they cannot be measured sequentially. And that's because the measurement of one disturbs the measurement of the other. So if we consider two famous non-commuting observables, namely the position and uh, position and momentum, then if we try to make a precise position moment measurement of a state psi, then that measurement collapses the state to one of the eigenstates of the position operator x0. And if we then try to make subsequent momentum measurements, then we'll just get random results because we're measuring a position eigenstate. Another consequence is that there's an intrinsic limit in how precisely these two properties, A and B, can be uh, simultaneously defined. Uh, in the case of X and P, this is nothing but the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, but in general, um, this this limit is given by the Robertson inequality, and it depends on the commutator between the two observables, the value of the commutator. So it's important to realize that although these two physical consequences are related, uh, one does not imply the other. And so it, it is, in fact, possible to measure so for example, the position and momentum simultaneously of some system without these measurements completely disrupting each other. Of course, and, and these types of measurements are called joint measurements. Uh, and when you make joint measurements, um, you're of course still limited by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And that's because that's a statement about the, the state. And it's not something which depends on, on how you make your measurement. It's really something intrinsic to the state. So to better uh, give you an idea of, of what joint measurements are, here I'm going to tell you how to make a bad joint measurement. And so what we want to do ideally is to simultaneously measure the position and momentum of some particle. And assuming we have very good measurement devices, we can try to saturate the Heisenberg uncertainty uh, principle, or at least do as good as we can to, for a particular state. So Whenever we make a measurement in, in quantum mechanics and we want to measure things like expectation values, we have to repeat that measurement many times. And so this means that we have access to an ensemble of, of perfect copies of the state that we're trying to measure psi. So we can imagine taking that ensemble and separating it into two. And with one half, we would measure position. And with the other half, we would measure uh, momentum. And uh, for instance, the position measurement will yield a probability distribution where the, the y-axis tells you the probability to get a particular x. And this probability distribution will be centered at some value x0, um, which is the expectation value of uh, the measurement operator x for this state psi. And similarly for momentum. Uh, and in addition to having a center, these probability distributions will have a width, and that width is what should go into the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And assuming our measurement devices are perfect and we have the correct uh, state, so a Gaussian weight packet, then we can saturate the Heisenberg bound. And so it might seem like we performed a, a good joint measurement because we we simultaneously measured position and momentum, and we saturated the bound. But the issue is that our measurements were independent. And so uh, 
the reason this is an issue is imagine, for example, that in the ensemble we had uh, an expanding gas. And um, so what that means is that if, if I take out uh, the, the particles in the, in, the, uh, in the ensemble will have correlations between the, their position and their momentum. So the, and if, if I take out two random particles out of that ensemble and I measure position on one and momentum on the other, then I won't be, this joint measurement won't be sensitive to these uh, correlations. And so it's, it, it seems as though this joint measurement is missing some, some information that could exist in the state. So just to review uh, what I've discussed so far, the first joint measurement strategy we considered was a sequential one. And the reason this doesn't work essentially is because of measurement collapse. So if we try to make a precise position of a measurement, it just collapses the same side to one of its eigenstates. And so then the momentum measurement tells us nothing. But there is a, a way around this, actually, uh, and that's to make this position measurement weak. But I won't be discussing that in this video. Another strategy that you, you may consider is to take one copy out of your ensemble and um, actually send it through a, a, a black box, which creates two copies of that state. And on one copy, measure the position, and on the other copy, the momentum. Now, clearly this won't work because of the, for the reasons I just discussed in the, in the previous slide, but another reason that this doesn't work is because of the no cloning theorem. So there is no black box that produces perfect copies of an arbitrary state. Now the third strategy, and this is the one that I'll be discussing for the rest of the video, is to use an optimal cloner. So there, the, the idea is to um, kind of do the, the best physical equivalent we can to uh, perfect copying. So um, this optimal cloner takes as an input the state which we want to copy, and also an ancilla. And this ancilla acts as a blank piece of paper onto which we can copy the information uh, that's encoded inside. And so what comes out of the optimal cloner is not perfect copies, but uh, clones. And these clones are contain some, some contamination which allow them to be this operation to be physical. And in, in particular, optimal cloners produce uh, clones in an entangled state. And this is exactly the missing ingredient in the previous strategies. Now, if we consider measuring the position uh, on one of these entangled clones and, and the momentum on the other, because of the entanglement, there'll be correlations in the outcomes. And these correlations are what, we're miss what was missing in, in, the previous, uh, in the previous strategy. So this idea was uh, for, proposed by, by Hoffman in this PRL, and he showed that despite the fact that the clones are imperfect, this actually ends up being a valid way to perform a joint measurement, and I'll, I'll show you why. So I will be focusing on cloning with polarization qubits, and in fact, the, the, they're probably the easiest system to, to perform optimal cloning on because all you need is, is a beam splitter. So this was uh, proposed by Buzik and Hillary in 1996. And the way that it works is through Hangul Mandel interference. So just to, to briefly remind uh, remind you what that is, it's an interference effect that occurs when uh, two identical photons impinge onto different ports of a beam splitter. And so by identical, I mean that they have the same polarization, they have the same spatial mode, and they they arrive at the beam splitter at the same time. If all those conditions are fulfilled, fulfilled then this Hongo-Mandel interference effect can happen. So to see what that interference effect is, let's consider the four possible uh, outcomes or the four possible uh, case, things that can happen at, at the beam splitter. So the, in each one of these outcomes are equally as probable and we should treat them as fame, Feynman amplitudes because we don't know which one will occur. And so then we should add them coherently with their phase to, to see the interference. And so the first case is that both photons reflect from the beam splitter, 
And here I'm using the convention that a reflection gives rise to a phase of I. So this, uh, this case gets a phase of minus one. If both photons transmit, then uh, there's a phase of one. And if one transmits and the other reflects, that gets a phase of I. And if you add these four different amplitudes together, you find that two of them interfere destructively and two of them interfere constructively. And the ones that interfere constructively are the cases where both photons exit from one port of the beam splitter. And so this is the hung mandel interference effect. If the photons are indistinguishable, then they always exit the beam splitter bunched. This is the interference effect that uh, we can use to implement an optimal cloner. And the way that works is we send onto a beam splitter the state which we want to clone. Here it's labeled by row A. And in the other arm of the beam splitter, we send our ancilla, which is a completely mixed state. And so this state is a statistical mixture of of being half the time equal to the input state that we want to clone and the other half of the time being orthogonal to it. And this is true regardless of what input state that we have here. So it really does act like a blank piece of paper and the cloner performs equally well regardless of what input state that we send it, meaning it's a universal cloner. So now we can look at what happens when these two beam splitters, when these two photons um, impinge onto the beam splitter. So half the time, this mixed state is equal to the, the input state here. And we know because of hongu mandel interference, they will always exit bunched together. Now, if we ignore the cases where they exit through the right side and, and only consider the cases through the left side, then we know that when they're identical, they always bunch. And the other half of the time, these two photons are uh, orthogonal. And in that case, there's only a 25% chance that they exit bunched in, in, in this port. So now we know that the relative probability that the photons that come out bunched from this port are going to be, the relative probability is higher for them to be identical than for them to be orthogonal. And this is the only, the only thing that we have to do to make optimal clones. So we have to project so this, when we look at bunching only, we're projecting onto the symmetric subspace of the two photon input states. That's what this post-selection on bunching is equivalent to mathematically. And so I label this projection uh, operation as this pi plus one. And so the state of the clones is given by this um, equation here, where this is our two photon input state. We can rewrite the state of the optimal clones in a little bit of a more um, revealing manner. In particular, we can write it as the sum of two terms, where one term is just a background or the, the source of the imperfections to the clones, and the other term, which is the coherent part of the cloning process, um, I refer to as twins. Now, keep in mind that by only looking at these twins, we're going to be looking at a non-physical part of the optimal cloner output. Um, but these twins are, are very interesting. Uh, they have the property that they're like perfect copies of the input state, row A, in the sense that if we make any measurement on either one of the twins, then we would get results identical to if we had made that measurement on the input state. But they're not like regular copies because these twins are entangled. And this entanglement is what was missing in our initial uh, joint measurement strategy of you know, measuring position on one copy and momentum on the other. Now that there's this entanglement in the twins, the measurements will, uh, the measurement results will be correlated. And in particular, if you, if you measure in our case, the projection onto the horizontal polarization and diagonal polarization, which are complementary projectors, then the outcome of that joint measurement gives you directly the state uh, of your input photon row A. So the way that it gives you the state is through a quasi probability distribution, but effectively we're directly measuring the state of that, of the, of that, pol that polarization state without any reconstruction algorithm.
So, so far I've only told you how to make optimal clones. I haven't told you how we could possibly isolate these twins. Um, but uh, it turns out that in the same paper I've showed you before, Hoffman uh, proposed uh, a way to do this, and it's to use a two photon partial swap gate. And this gate is a generalized symmetry operation where instead of just projecting onto the symmetric subspace, we now allow for a projection onto any symmetry subspace, which is um, specified by this uh, phase J here. Now, if we look at this projection onto our two photon input state, then we can rewrite uh, the output of that, of that operation as the sum of two terms. Again, we have this, this noise term but now we have the twins that appear with this, this phase J in front. And so you can show that if you add the correct, uh, this term with the correct phases, then you can isolate the twins from this noise term. And so experimentally, the way that we, that we achieve this, this uh, generalized symmetry operation is to have an interferometer after the beam splitter, which uh, does the hongo mandel interference. So after the beam splitter, we, we can coherently combine the cases where the photons bunched with the cases where they didn't bunch. And in particular, by changing this phase phi here in the interferometer, we can select the phase j that we're um, in, in the phase J here. So the way that we isolate the twins experimentally is to repeat our experiment four times and each time we're measuring complementary polarization projections, projectors uh, here and here. And we'll add the measurement results that we got in those four experiments each time with a different phase J. And we control that phase with this this beam splitter here. So uh, what we get from this, this measurement, this joint measurement on the twins is, as I said, it's uh, a quasi-probability distribution, which is an, tells you the state of our input photon. So in the x and y axis, we have the different uh, polarization projectors, so diagonal, anti-diagonal, horizontal and vertical, sorry, the, the different polarization values. And in the z-axis, we have the quasi-probability. So this is something like a Wigner function. And it, it can, uh, unlike the Wigner function, uh, this quasi-probability distribution, which is called the Dirac distribution, can be complex. So uh, here I'm plotting both the real and imaginary part for, I think, uh, right-hand circular polarized photon or sorry, left-hand circular. And, and from this Dirac distribution, we can extract uh, more conventional descriptions of the quantum state, like the wave function or the density matrix. And this is what I'm showing here. Uh, so here, the, the bold line is what we expect as the theory, and these are the data points. And we can see that the agreement is, is fairly good. So our, our, our measurement is correctly um, determining the state of that polarization for that um, polarized photon. So to summarize, uh, I've shown you that hidden in the output of an optimal cloner are uh, a, an interesting object, which we call twins. And these twins are, are perfect, but entangled copies of, of your input state that you send into the cloner. And this is, these, are, these twins are ideal for performing uh, joint measurements. And so I, I've also showed you that you can isolate the measurement results that you would get with twins um, by using an interferometer after our, our optimal cloner. And finally, uh, I showed you that if you measure complementary observables on these twins, then that joint measurement gives you uh, the quantum state of the copied, uh, the cloned uh, input state. And this has some relevance for state determination because it allows you to directly determine 
uh, your uh, a state so without having to, to, to use quantum state tomography, for example, where you have to perform a, a global reconstruction. So here you can really probe your state at a particular uh, point. And moreover, there are some interesting implications for, for quantum foundations because it turns out that this joint measurement strategy gives you the exact same um, values, of, namely the Dirac distribution, um, than what you would get if you would have done the joint measurement with uh, a different strategy through weak measurement. And so these are two very different physical uh, mechanisms to perform the joint measurement, and yet there's this uh, connection between uh, optimal cloning and, and weak measurement, which is not really yet fully understood. So if you would like more information about this work, I invite you to read uh, our paper, which is published in Physical Review Letters. Here is the reference. And you can also um, leave a comment if you have some questions or send me an email. This is my email address. And uh, here's a photo of the other uh, collab my collaborators on this project. And uh, feel free to ask them any questions as well. So thank you for your attention.